करीब हु इज दिस मैन कॉल या वही दिन या वही we who are black people in this town seek salvation every day we are the descendants of those who have suffered years upon years and if you know anything about our history you know that each time we feel that the world is coming to an end somebody comes our way look back over the years when all was down hearted the night was dark the way was weary and we wondered what would happen and along came martin to send us on our lighted way and just as we thought things might get better things got worse and along came out the sinners on our lighted way and when we thought everything was going to be all right that freedom was finally ours no more welfare checks no more food stamps no more riding on the back of the bus no more standing outside to order our food we thought that we were on our lighted way and things got worse and along came Whitney and along came Farrakhan a lighted way like people said the day has come no more shall we wait for all is free for us to take we have tried slavery bucked it out we've tried integration left it out we tried all those things on our lighted way but things ain't got no better we wait and we wait and we wait and we wait and then somebody calls themselves Yahweh bin Yahweh He comes after all of those great men, those personalities that have woven the fabric of escapism into our lighted way. He comes and says to you and to me, I've got the key. He says the formula is very simple. Nothing tough. Nothing hard. Simply circle yourselves together. Hold on to each other. Change your attitude about yourself. Change your attitude about your brother. smile and say the world is mine and the world will be yours (laughs) 
We don't need to wait for others to do what we know that we must do. So says Yahweh bin Yahweh. We don't need to wait on a government stipend to pave the way. So says Yahweh bin Yahweh. We don't need to be dependent on nobody but ourselves. So says Yahweh bin Yahweh. Pool your pennies, pool your dollars, pool your talents, pool your energy, and the world is yours. Who is this man, Yahweh bin Yahweh? How dare he suggest that I am human? How dare he suggest that I can do it by myself? How dare he bring the light to my lighted way? He dared to do it because he's Yahweh bin Yahweh. giving all praises to our Father Yahweh and his most faithful, most royal, most humble servant, Yahweh Ben Yahweh. As I've lived and experienced things through my life, there comes a time in everyone's life when you meet that special person that gives you a vision of what you can do. That gives you a vision about what our people can do collectively together. And I've been fortunate enough to meet the man who has been able to bring that about. And that gentleman is no other than Yahweh Ben Yahweh. Yahweh Ben Yahweh came to the city of Miami all alone in 1979 and he founded and established the nation of Yahweh. Yahweh Ben Yahweh majored in mathematics and music at Texas College and was in the U.S. military as a technical instructor and math teacher. He received a B.S. degree in social science at Phillips University and attended the University of Oklahoma's law school. He has a master's degree in economics from Atlanta University. Since coming to Miami, Yahweh Ben Yahweh has helped people to establish and maintain businesses with assets of over $100 million. Through economic development, Yahweh Ben Yahweh has raised the property value of communities by his perfect models of excellence throughout Miami. Yahweh Ben Yahweh's work in economic development has enhanced all areas where the nation of Yahweh has property. He is showing people how to move in reality from poverty to riches. He is instilling moral principles, ethics, and pride in people who choose to follow his teachings. The results are an improvement in the moral fiber of a person as an individual, and in people as a whole. Yahweh Ben Yahweh has stood up all by himself to bring about an awakening for a people who've been lost for a very long time. He has put together the kind of model of excellence and superior quality that you and I as a people must begin to produce in this country and all over the world because never before has it ever been done that the world can look toward you and I as being a producer, a developer, and a builder until now. And Yahweh Ben Yahweh has all the keys, all the answers, 
and all the solutions to all of our problems. I must let all so-called black people in America know that Yahweh has made Yahweh been Yahweh, both Lord and Christ. Although you have crucified Yahweh been Yahweh, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Yahweh ben Yahweh for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of understanding of the holy words of Yahweh. For all promises of the Bible belong to you and your children forever, and to all people. At this time, I'd like for you to stand and with a warm round of applause, bring out the most eminent, the most noble, the most honorable Yahweh ben Yahweh. Yahweh. Hallelujah, Yahweh. I'm just coming off of a 21-day fast for this event. Praise Yahweh. And I just had, earlier this morning, I had some heavenly bean soup. And it was good. I have been fasting for the deliverance of our people in general, and that there be peace and healing in the Miami community. I'd like to welcome all of you present, all of you my friends, believers. I thank you for honoring the presence of Yahweh in our midst today. Among the so-called black men of America first, and then the world at large. 
not only to you who are physically present, but I speak to the ether. And when I speak to the ether, that goes all around the earth by sound vibration. And it will have the desired effect and it will continue to circle until it settles on the dead mentality that resides in America. But first, I have some words to speak. Bienvenidos, Yahweh es el creador de los cielos y la tierra y yo soy su hijo. Yahweh ben Yahweh. Yo soy el príncipe de la paz, tu salvador. He establecido el gobierno imperecedero de Yahweh y la paz con juicio y justicia para todas las naciones. Yahweh bendecida e quien me bendigo. Primero debo redimir a hombre negro de americano y después todas las familias del mundo serán bendecidas los amo eternamente bienvenu Yahweh a la clair a la tour du ciel a de la terre a je suis son fils Yahweh ben Yahweh je suis le prince de la paix volte sauveur c'est moi qui ai attendu le royaume éternel de Yahweh. À de la paix avec jugement, à justice pour toutes les nations. Yahweh béni Ara, ce docteur vous qui le bénisse. En premier lieu, je dois se souhaiter. L'homme nous a d'Amérique à poursuite. On voit toutes les familles de la terre seront bénies. Je vous aime pour la terre nique. Your coso, Yahweh wa tento, chino, sozo, ushate, ati. Watashiwa, sono, kotet. Yahweh ben Yahweh. What Tashiwa ke wano kami anatano swinu shidet adi. What Tashiwa subete no kunavini no tamie no shilpanto seigi o motet tokoshi ani tuzuku Yahweh to e wano kota o set shirishusta. What Tashio shukufuku sudu monobo Yahweh Washu kufu kufu sidu. Watashiwa mazut Americano kokujino aganawa na kereba noranae. So sureba watashio to get that tijo ono subete no kazo kuga shuku kufu sade ju nado. Watashiwa toani. Anatagata o Aesuru. Huan Yin, Yahweh Shur TND, Dutchman Shur Ga. Erwa Shur Yahweh, Dan Fu Yahweh Ben Yahweh. Wa Shur Hoping, Da Wong Fu, Liman Dai Kyo Shur Ju. Wa Jian Li, Lanang Dai Ge, Chin Chu, Jia Gong Li, Her Jong Yi Da Bu Shu. Yahweh Sirfu Niman Da Tong Shu, Wa Ya Da Dao Da Sirfu. Wa Bi Shi Shi In Jong Yi O, Me Yi Du A Da Her Yang, Er Ho Fa Su Wa Da De Yi Shin Shong Shu, Yi Wan Shu Chi A Shong Me Yi A Ga Da Ding Dao Shou Do Sirfu. Wa Yi Da 
this moment, I would like to bring to our attention a question. Who is Yahweh? Yahweh is the God of the Bible, the King James Version of the Bible. When you hear about in the beginning, it reads in original Hebrew, Yahweh created the heavens and the earth. It is Yahweh who parted the Red Sea that we, the Hebrew children, went through. It is Yahweh who did not allow the children in the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to be burned. Yahweh is the God of the Bible that beats up on all the other gods, beats up on all the other people that you read about in the Bible. And he's the man that you should want to know. Yahweh is, in English, Y-A-H-W-H. In the Hebrew, it is Yuhei Wahe. I invite you to do your own research, seek out this name, and be convinced in your own mind what it means and what it means to you. Before I finish telling you about who Yahweh is, I want to share a few things with you. I was born to a family of 15, and I'm the oldest of 15 children. I went to school in a little town called Enid, Oklahoma, Booker T. Washington. And there was something very interesting about Booker T. Washington School. It was, of course, segregated. But I'm sure that there are many of you who can relate to what I experienced in Booker T. Washington. And that was this. 90% of all of the graduates went to college. Always. That was tradition at Booker T. Washington. 90% went to college. And then when integration came, it reversed. Booker T. Washington disappeared, first of all. Everybody was merged into Enid High School, which was all white. By that time, I had left. I didn't go to an integrated school. Nevertheless, the reverse happened. Since integration, 90% of the students don't go to college. And of course, we were all taught that if you want to excel in America, you were going to have to be 10 times better than all other people. Any of you remember hearing that? Did you grow up like that? I think that went on among all of us all across America. We were told, if you want to make it, you had to be 10 times better. You had to, and you had to get your books. But then, of course, after getting my books, there was something else that I was interested in. It was called, how do you get rich in America? So I was looking for the keys of how do you get rich? How do you move from poverty to riches? And I looked around at my teachers, and I could see they hadn't found the keys. <laughs> you could follow them home and see where they lived, and it was understood they definitely didn't have the keys. But they kept telling me and all of us in school that you've got to go to college to get it. And I thought that was rather strange. I said, well, they must have been busy when they were passing out the keys. <laughs> because my teachers came back without them. But at any rate, they convinced me, along with the other 90%, that you should go to college. So I went. I'm on my odyssey. I'm, I'm going on my odyssey now to get the keys. So I went to Texas College, and I majored in math and music. And of course, I looked around the campus, and none of the teachers had moved from poverty to riches. And I thought that was really interesting. Obviously, it wasn't on the campus I went to. That was Texas College. And the keys weren't there. And then while I was there, before I could finish and, and, and say, well, maybe it was at the senior year or something, I, I got this beautiful letter. I got some beautiful letters from the United States government. 
and it said, greetings. Can you imagine getting a, 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 such a letter from the United States government as greetings? I thought that was great when I read it. Can, look, I got a letter from the United States government and they, they're giving me greetings. And then that was before I read the body of the letter. And in the body of the letter it said, we want you to come and die for your country. And since my, some of my relatives own funeral homes, and I saw a lot of dead folk, and none of them were moving from poverty to riches. So I knew I didn't want to address the greetings in this letter, especially those who were calling, you know, like the army, be all you can be dead. So since the Korean War and all this was so hot, I decided that I didn't want to go where they wanted me to go, so I joined. You know what I joined. Air Force. Come and fly with me. I didn't want to be a pilot because I knew they crash and get shot down. Didn't want to be a mechanic because that might be too close to the front line. So I was able to maneuver and I got a job in the Air Force, uh, again, teaching math. And then my second job was, and finally complete job, was a uh, tactical instructor. And that's where I taught white troops to be patriotic so they could die for their country. And I did a great job at that. <laughs> One of the most interesting jobs I had <laughs> in my life. And of course, after spending my necessary time in the Air Force, I got an honorable discharge. I had served my country well. And I then had a GI Bill. And I went back to Phillips University, which was in my hometown, Enid, Oklahoma. Just before going into the military, they had rejected all black students coming there, and I was one of those rejected. But by this time, they had opened the door, so I went because it was very convenient. It was home, so I could struggle through and, and make it. But then once again, I got a, 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 a Bachelor of Science degree in, social, social, in the social sciences, et cetera, from Phillips University. But I noticed there that no one had moved from poverty to riches. Uh, none of the doctorate uh, professors, none of the teachers, and none of the students. And of course, none of the black students were moving from poverty to riches. Uh, there were only five of them, and I was one of those. And I was looking for the keys. How do you move from poverty to riches? It wasn't there. So then I got the idea, maybe it's in law school. So I went to the University of Oklahoma Law School. And a peculiar thing happened there. Dean of law school, he came out. Here's this big, huge freshman class. We're all sitting there. And he said, Guess what? Unless you students are willing to deal with unethical characters, unless you're willing to deal with crooks, maybe even be a little unethical, then law school is not for you. 30% of the class got up and walked out. And I looked around, and I began to listen. And I could tell that I didn't want to be a part of the things that I was hearing. No one there was moving from poverty to riches either in that particular setting. So then it hit me. Still on my odyssey, it has to be in economics. So I went to Atlanta University, took a master's degree in economics. While there, none of my teachers had moved from poverty to riches. Those that were, were uh, doctors, they were wearing runover shoes driving may start automobiles, living in deteriorated housing. Not one of them had moved from poverty to riches. I'm asking for the keys, looking for the keys, studying big, thick books in economics. The most distressing thing was not one of the professors had ever run a business. So they couldn't give me a key as to how to run one from personal experience nor had one of them ever owned a business. So here I am taking a master's degree from people who can't teach me how to own one. 
Needless to say, they didn't have the keys. So I took the paper, and they tried to get me to go to Harvard, Princeton, any of those who sat on my thesis committee. They wanted me to go to these schools, big recommendations. I said, you a product, and you want me to teach theory? No, I have to move on. I'm looking for the keys, how to move from poverty to riches. So as I began to wander around, I then became very conscious of the many different religions that exist. And of course, I was born a Christian. My father was a preacher when I was born, and he's still one now, uh, with several churches. And, uh, that's the way I was born. And they didn't have the keys. I didn't see it. They weren't giving it up if they had it. <laughs> so then I studied all religions. When I say all religions, that, that includes Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Al-Islam, all of that. I went and I was serious. I studied. And I kept looking for the keys. And I, I noticed I ran across one group. They wanted me to shave my head, put on a chiffon robe, walk barefoot, carry a bowl around in my hand, and walk around and beg for some food. I knew that wasn't the way to, <laughs> to move from poverty to riches. So, I, and I saw people that said they had walked all kind of paths, you know, like eight paths, and, and I saw they didn't have it. Then I came back up on a group of bishops one day. They were trying to groom me for a bunch of churches. They told me if I serve them well and be their valet, you know, one day I'll be, they'll bless me to be a bishop. So I said, well, I just have a question. Uh, are, are, are you all, there were several bishops in the room now, you listed there several bishops in the room. So are you all uh, men of God? Yes! <laughs> men of God? <laughs> I said, wait a minute, just calm down. I just wanted to know, yes, man of God. Yes, sir. Lord, call me. Okay, that's, that's great. That's wonderful. Now, what I want to know about is the keys to how you get from poverty to riches. I see all of you all are doing quite well. Well, don't worry about it. Just take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. If you got a problem, he'll fix it. I said, fine, fine, but what about the money? I want to know about the money. Well, you just give your money to the Lord. We take up the money, you know, in the Lord's name. I said, I understand, but see, what I want to know, are you really close, close to the Lord? Yes, I'm the Lord's man. I met him personally myself. That's well, then you ought to be able to help me. All I want from you is the Lord's address so I can go and meet him with my own offering. Maybe he'll give me the key. You know I blew it, don't you? <laughs> I got kicked out. So that left me wandering around, still seeking, praying, meditating, looking for the keys, poverty, the riches. And then one day I met a man who taught me how to take nothing and make something. He taught me how to enjoy a perfect peace of mind, how to absolutely move from poverty to riches, and he obligated me to share this with those who are worthy and those who desire to make a difference in their life, and that man's name is John. He raised me from a dead level, perpendicular to the earth, he made me recta tutum, and gave me the secrets of how to raise the dead. And anointed me to come in his name, to bear his name, and to do his will and to do his work. And that's who I am as Yahweh Ben Yahweh, that's my name. I come in his name, I come bearing his name, I come in his protection, and all the works that I do are in his name. And he being the God of the Bible, we have evidence from 
scrolls that have been dug up in Jerusalem that are over 6,000 years old. This name, Yuhewape, is there. This name existed before I took up this body. This name is historical and it's the ancient of days. All scholars, all nations that remember the name, honor the name. And of course, all nations that have forgotten the name are turned into hell. But whatever I do, whatever I build, is in the name Yahweh. So when you look at our fleet of buses, you see Yahweh's name on it. When you see any of our businesses, you see Yahweh's name on it. Yuhewape. I give him the glory for all that I do. In other words, I'm content to be born on the earth and never take credit as a person separate from God doing anything. And I believe that this would be a wonderful world to live in if all men would give credit to the Creator for what they do. Do it in His name and let His name live. Praise God, they bless you. So in my body, I count it as nothing not concerned about it. I'm concerned about carrying out the will of the Creator Yahweh. Who are the Hebrew Israelites? They are the ones who take hold to what I teach and carry it into practice. I must warn everybody that not all who wear white and dress like me are worthy to wear it, nor are they all mine. People can wear what they want to. In fact, I invite my followers and disciples that I'm gathering across this country, don't put on white. You know, it's time for us to be real smart today and not let everybody know everything we know and where we stand and all that we do. Praise Yahweh. Truly, my work is across America, and I have followers and disciples across this country in greater numbers than you would ever dream. And you can't measure even the group that is here today by how many are in this county or in this state that love what I'm doing. We are real smart today. We know that, yes, we know. The FBI tried to stop me from being here this week. They were all over our property. They did everything to try to tie me up to keep me from being here this day. And they even interfered and, and arrested some of my followers to try to put us in a, in a hindrance position. So we're smart enough not to let them take all of our pictures, so we're not all here today. But if they start something, they'll find out how many is in the street. They will find out. There's more with me than with them. Praise Yahweh. So I'm positive that you, the FBI, you're sitting in here, and may your ears be full, and you take it all back to your superiors, whatever you can glean today. I know that Yahweh has a hot water for you. If you don't leave me alone, you'll find out. I told all of you years ago that you're in the presence of a man who will stand for you. I'm not a coward and I'm not a rabbit. So there's not anything that can make me run. Everything that could be written against a man has been written against me. And I stand here today victorious, ever growing, and stronger, and there's nothing they can do about it.
Who are you, black man of America? Who are you, so-called black man of America? That's the question. That's the most important question that I can ask tonight. Who are you? How many of you remember being colored? You remember being colored? Those were the days, weren't there? When we were colored? I mean, we were most important when we were colored. We had all kinds of things named after us when we were colored. We had colored towns, colored water fountains, colored waiting rooms. But colored, was, that, that was the day. We even had national organizations named after us when we were colored. National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Weren't we something? And of course, something happened. We went through a metamorphosis. I know I began to ask the question, uh, you're colored, but do you speak colored East? You know, the Japanese speak Japanese. Do you have a colored name? Well, you know, the Japanese have a Japanese name, right? Well, is there a map somewhere on the earth with colored land on it? And all these answers were no, no, no. Nobody had a yes answer, affirmative. So. Well, why do you call yourself colored? Don't answer, don't answer, don't worry about the answer. They couldn't answer. So then we went through a change. We, some of our scholars, they went, they looked on the map. Because we needed a change. We got tired of, of being colored. So you want to go out of the country? What is your nationality? I'm colored. They looked on the map, our think tank group, and they came up with, River. You know the name of it. Niger. You know, N-I-G-E-R. <laughs> and they didn't want that, that was too close to the other G, you know, nigger. <laughs> they said, no, we can't come up with that. So they, they dropped, we better not name ourselves after a river. So they came up with what? The Negro days. How many of you used to be Negroes? Remember the Negro days? Big days, weren't they? Until I went around asking the question, well, do you speak Negro? -y? Do you have a Negro name? Can you show me any place on the map, Negro land? No, 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 I can't show any of that. So Negro is your nationality? Well, okay. So then they had to come up with something else. And I don't have it up here. They, didn't give me my little package that I brought, but I had something to show you. Somebody came out with a song, said, I'm black and I'm proud. Remember that? I'm black and I'm proud. Say it again. I'm black and I'm proud. Say it louder. I'm black and I'm proud. <laughs> How many remember being black? What's your nationality? Black, what's wrong with you? Can't you see? I'm black and I'm beautiful. Remember the black and the beautiful days? You know, during that time, they also, they went over, went overseas. Well, before then, we started wearing the dashikis, and we had a little thing with some, some uh, you know, prongs on it. What was it called? Pick. Yeah, that's right, a pick, Afro pick. You know, pick that Afro out, right? So by this time, we got some money, and we started traveling, went, over the, went overseas. Guess what? In Africa, there wasn't one African wearing a dashiki. Nobody in Africa had a pick. Looked on the pick, it was made in Hong Kong. <laughs> they came back to the country, spread the word. Nobody in Africa is wearing dashiki. Nobody's wearing Afro. So guess what the brothers did then? They, they threw the picks down, took off the dashiki, went to the beauty parlor, 
pushed the women out that seat, went curly perm on them. So I had to ask, well, what's your nationality? Black. Well, what goes on your driver's license? The big B. Do you speak blackies? No. Do you have a black name? <laughs> no. No. Do I have a black name? Can you show me black land on the map? No, can't do that either. So your nationality is black. So then we had a, th now this is going around so strong, running around the country, asking these questions. I know I ask these questions of wherever I go in the country. So then our intellectuals and leaders got together about two years ago. Y'all remember the meeting? What did they come up with? African American. They tried to be Afro American at first. That didn't quite fit. Afro. <laughs> Do you have an Afro? They got it together and came up with African. They said, well, there's Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans, Italian Americans. So we got to be some kind of American. So they came up with African Americans. And that ought to stop this Yahweh being Yahweh from running around asking these questions. How many African Americans in here tonight? One. Only one. Two. One up there. That's an African American. You got a couple of African Americans here. Since I'm on this kick, uh, I have some questions to ask. How many still colored? Yeah, man. All the colored people are gone. <laughs> How many Negroes in here tonight? Still some Negroes left. All the Negroes are gone. Can you believe this? How many black folks still left? One black woman, two. One black man over there, three black folks. Anybody else? Three black folk left. Everybody else is paranoid. They're scared to be African Americans, right? I don't know what he's going to say next. Well, I have one. I have, yes, yes, yes. You're right. It was best don't raise your hands. Because I have a, about three hard questions for all you African Americans. I know you're waiting on me. I, I, I see, I hear, I, I know. I just want to know first, do you speak African? And the answer is, there's not, there is no African on the earth, and I have some followers who are Africans from several parts of Africa. They are my followers, my disciples. They don't speak African. There's no such thing on the continent. It's tribal languages. Okay, you got me, Yahweh, on that one. I asked this all over America, so don't feel strange. Then I asked, well, my next question is, you don't speak African. Do you have an African name? Yep, yeah, Lamomba, Sikoturi, Mandela. Now, what you got to say about that? Plenty. Those are not African names. Those are tribal names. Mandela speaks Bantu. Those are, those are tribal names. So nobody in Africa has an African name. Okay, let's see what you got for this next one about this map business. I'm waiting on you, right? Tell me about this map thing. All right, right. I can't ask you, is there a place on the, on the map called Africa? Because maps do show that. But I still have a question. How long has that continent been called Africa? You certainly cannot find it on any of the ancient maps, and I've seen several. Nowhere on any ancient map is the word Africa. So that means that Africa is a recent term. 
That means somebody changed the name from what it was to Africa. And my question is, who changed it? The same people that changed your name from to green and underwood, berry cloth and green and black. So now, how many African Americans are left? They've gone away too. <laughs> so that was my original question. Who are you? I'm here to say tonight, it is impossible to move from poverty to riches eternally, not knowing who you are, not knowing your nationality, your history, your culture, your language, your name, your land, and your God. Without this knowledge, you can't move from poverty to riches. And I say to America, you can never prosper as long as you have 60 million black folk in America who don't know who they are sitting next to your child who knows who he is. So as I get ready to go into how to move from poverty to riches, then I ask all of you who are my Gentile friends sitting in the audience tonight and all of the other nations that are sitting here tonight, you who are Hispanic and whatever nationality you are, be patient with me. I'll come back to you in a few minutes. You'll be able to get a lot of keys. But first, I want to address my people's condition and rescue them and bring them up to a level and then we can all enjoy the benefit of my message together. We'll be on par one with the other. Yes. Praise Yahweh. So what am I saying? I'm saying simply that with our people having the knowledge of themselves and their kind taken from them. When our children go into a public school setting, they go there with a disadvantage because all of the other children, they know their history, their culture, their heritage. If they're from German parents, they know that and they know the history of Germany. So they sit there in the classroom here in America saying within their head, reinforced from home, I am a German American. And if anything happens in this country and I don't like it, I can go back to my homeland, Germany. And that goes true from the white child that's from England, uh, from anywhere in Europe, naming any country. That is true for any Japanese sitting in the classroom. He knows if anything goes wrong, he can always go back to Japan. And when it comes to our poor little children, when they tell you to go home or go somewhere, you don't know where to go. They say Africa, you don't know where in Africa to go. And you don't want to go after watching Tarzan. And Umbawana. I mean, Tarzan is awesome, isn't he? All the animals come when he calls, everything. <laughs> Everything gets out of the way of Tarzan. Oh, 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 wow. <laughs> he whips up on alligators, kills them in the water. Be 50 Africans run up on him. He beat up all of them. They all run the other way. I mean, and then you see Africans in the movies, the, all these bones in the nose, stuff hanging from the ears. You don't want to go to that. So you really get insulted and upset when somebody tells you, go home to Africa. You want to fight. I'm born in America. So to you, the various nations that are present tonight, you know your history, and culture, and languages. And all of you know that I'm dealing with a group of people who have been robbed of the knowledge of themselves. And until I get the black man back on track, until the black man of America is back on track, this great country, America, will never get back on track. 
When I teach the black man of America to move from poverty to riches, as you have already accomplished and demonstrated in your works as people, then the whole country will once again prosper. As long as you have almost 60 million people as an underclass, who you have to work almost 60% of your time in taxes to take care of a bunch of people who don't want to take care of themselves, how can you prosper? America should be glad that I'm here and men like me are here to address this reality that it's time for the black man of America to stop blaming white people for their downfall, their condition, their poverty, their hell, and get up off of it, get up off of it, and let's go to work ourselves and get it done. And I must stop and take the time at this moment and address that reality. You know, it's, it's a shame when you look out at, at white people who the mother, the father, the sister, the brother, the cousin, the niece, the nephew, the uncle, and the aunt, they all get together, get two jobs, work day and night, work 18 hours a day, save one salary, put all their money together, build a plant. Sacrifice 10 years or more and put their money together and build a manufacturing plant. And soon as that plant is completed and they are ready to open it, something strange happens in America. Real strange. There's a bunch of people that look like you and me. Say, so have you heard? There's a new plant. Just open up. And I wonder, is they hiring? Is they hiring? I'm going to fill out my resume, go get my, my vacation, and look for a job. So they go running out to the new plant, put in an application. People say, well, I'm sorry. We have all that we need right now. Because who have they hired? They've hired their niece, their nephew, their uncle, their cousin, uh, their brother, their sister. The people who sacrificed to put this place together, doesn't it make sense that they would hire them? First, they're the ones that put their money together and worked enslaved to get it. They came here as immigrants too. And guess what we'll say when they don't hire us? Prejudice! Discriminate! I know what we'll do. We'll pick at you. We'll boycott your business. We'll put you out of business. You better hire us. That is so dumb. Who is keeping you, black man and woman, from you and your mother and father, sister and brother, cousin and niece and nephew and uncle and aunt, from getting together and working two jobs and saving one and putting your money together and save your money for 10 or 20 years and open up your own manufacturing plan and hire yourself. I know, I know that hurts some of you. You don't like to hear, get up and do it yourself. But that's exactly what I have done. And I have moved us, all who follow me, to a $100 million empire across the country. I've done it, and we have put our pennies together. Just a few of us have put our pennies together, and we have built it, and we don't beg anybody to do anything for us. We're not prejudiced. We just believe in doing what America offers. This is a land of opportunity. Why don't all of our people count on that one? Because we don't want to sacrifice. We don't want to pay the price. We want to sit around and, and choke America to death. And I'm here to say the jobs are going out of America. And unless you get up right now and join hands with me and build something for yourself, 
you are absolutely doomed and you're not gonna have anything to pick it. See, you better watch what George Bush is doing. He told you to read his lips. He said no more taxes and he lied. Taxes are killing the businessman. How can, how can businessmen expand when they're paying an ever increasing tax load? How, the only way they can expand is that there are lowering of taxes or taxes being eradicated. It's a very wicked system of taxation in this country. Put men out of business. And the people you're looking for a job from are going out. What are you gonna do? Just keep looking for welfare? That's on less and less people. It's on the shoulder of less and less people who can take care of your own welfare. You think drugs are gonna last always? The drug business isn't gonna last always. So let's move on to, for a minute to the social side. Because you might say, well, if we're supposed to do all of this, how can we? I just told you, I gave you a key. Wisdom of Yahweh is the highest. Y'all do hear him working, don't you? That's Yahweh out there rumbling. Yeah, that, that, that's him. He's incredible, isn't he? If you don't like him, you step out when that, that lightning is going down. He'll teach you some respect. When Yahweh is doing that, I go inside. I'm his son, I know to go inside. I like that. That's, that's a lot of power out there. The wisdom of Yahweh is the highest. Yahweh is the name of God. There's no wisdom higher than God. So when you take on the knowledge of Yahweh, you gain wisdom. With this wisdom, we're able to build. I've come to establish the perfect moral society of the elite God here. That means that every one of you sitting in this auditorium tonight are here because it's your divine destiny to be here. You are here because you have chosen from within yourself to learn how can I move from poverty to riches? How can I improve my condition? That's why you're here. It tells you also that not everybody wants to move from poverty to riches. How many of you have ever heard our people say, uh, how you doing today? And they say, fairly middling. Anybody? Yeah, that's all the way across the country. Fairly middling. How, how much money would you like to have? Oh, just enough to get by. How many heard of that? I mean, our people act like they're afraid to be rich. Like it's a sin. I've heard all kind of brainwashing all my life against being rich, but rich people have problems. Have you seen poor people lately? <laughs> Just to get to this auditorium, you have to come through the homeless. That's poor. Our social problems are solved when you take on the knowledge of God. That's the key in moving from poverty to riches. Let's deal with the educational aspect. You probably saw on display this evening some of the talents of our students at Yahweh University. If you came in a little late, you missed it, but I think we were here long enough for you to see some of it. I decided to not show the film which would have highlighted them but you can see that at some future date. You can come by our headquarters building. We'll be happy to show it to you. Nevertheless, Yahweh University is an independent school. I'm the founder of Yahweh University. As an independent school, it means that we write their curriculum. Being an independent school, Yahweh University, it means that we write the textbooks. And it means that there are people inside the textbook whose pictures 
look like us. And since all of the pictures look like us, it means that our students have high self-esteem. And one of the books that I've written for that particular school is Yahweh Ben Yahweh's math, Divine Mathematics, Designed to Rule Forever. And that's exactly what it is. Our children are, are taught how to count. How many of you were taught how to count? Like, you know, one plus one is two. How many of you? You were taught that? So what is one plus one? Two, how many say two? Hmm. You've been burnt before, haven't you? Already tonight, so you're gun shy. All of my students will ask you, to what? One plus one, one what plus one what? Equals two what? See, they know that one plus one equaling two is nothing but numerals. My children want to know what the number is. They understand that a number is an idea. So when they say, when you say one plus one equals two to them, they say, well, yes, but what's the idea? What's your idea? My little fellas, five years old, will ask you that question. You know that one nothing plus one nothing equals two nothing? And you know what the Bible says about that? Nothing from nothing leaves nothing and less than nothing. No wonder you're in poverty with nothing. Because you learn to count in theory, but not in reality. So now that you've learned that lesson, I have another counting question for you. One apple seed plus one apple seed how many says equals two apple seeds? Yeah, one, two. Don't be afraid, it's all right. We're just having a little fun. How many say one apple seed plus one apple seed equals two apple seeds? Okay, we got a few hands. Wrong. I knew it, I just thought he would say that. Wrong. One apple seed plus one apple seed equals two apple trees with 400 apples on each tree and 12 seeds in inside of each apple, and those planted will give you a humongous arches. <laughs> and my children will say to you, well, what do you do with the arches? Say, well, you, you need trucks to haul all those apples to the manufacturer, and you need a truck trucks to haul them to the stores that we're going to own to sell them in, like first-rate foods. You will need stores to sell your apple juice, and apple butter, apple cider, and apples. That's money. That's an industry. And you ask you, how many of you have ever eaten an apple? Yeah, you can raise your hand. What did you do with your core? What, you did what with it? So you threw your riches away. And you wonder why you're in poverty. All you do is eat. You eat up everything and then throw it away. And you think you're throwing your money away. Here's an orchard, thousands of trees. Some of the limbs die, some of the trees die. What does that become? Wood. What do you do with wood? Chairs, tables, furniture, houses. Why don't you own an orchard? You eat enough fruit <laughs> to plant the world. You know what was strange to me? I come to Miami, I come to South Florida, and I'm looking at black folk. They got avocado trees, mango trees, orange and trees, grapefruit trees. What else? Banana trees. You know, all these fruit trees. The Cubans come from Cuba, walk around through our neighborhood, 
Say, may I have the fruit off your trees? Like, well, say, yeah, honey, go on, help yourself. They strip the trees, go out on the corner, sell all the fruit to come off your trees, come back and buy up your neighborhood with it. I think it's wonderful that they do that. But what's sad, what is really compounding the sadness to the matter is, here come these same women that just gave away all the fruit from their trees, come in our store and buy avocados, mangoes, <laughs> and all those fruits that they just gave away. Isn't that sad? And we wonder why we live in poverty. Sound like you're getting some good keys. Our children have learned all these secrets up front. They know it now. They're saving their seeds right now, asking when can they plant them. So we'll be looking for some land so they can plant. And see, the, the people that feed themselves determine their grocery prices. You know, the people that grow the food, that's who determine the grocery price. How much will you pay to eat? whatever they charge. And when they get through charging you, how much money do you have left? Not much. So we have an independent school, and our children are learning all of these independent type thoughts. We just had our second graduation in September. We had one in March. Every six months, we have a graduation. Our children came out at age 17, and upon graduation, every one of them, they went into one of our businesses as managers. The majority of the graduates in March are running our multi-million dollar supermarket, First Rate Foods in Overtown, graduates from Yahweh University. So what does that mean? And the ones that just graduated uh, in September last month, they're in training at this minute to run our hotels, some of our hotels, and also we're training them in this particular area, in this location, in this city, so they'll be ready to run our skyscraper that we just bought in downtown Atlanta. That hotel will open up this month in downtown Atlanta. You're just gonna have to come to see it. It is fine, the Barclay Hotel, we own it. Flat straight up and down on it, it is first class. Ritz Carlton, Hyatt has nothing on us. We just have a little cheaper price than they do. What's strange about Miami, they say, black people be saying things like, we need a, Black Hotel in Miami. We need some Black Hotel. We have five in Miami. Why do you want to pretend ours is invisible? And then you have some that are boycotting Black Hotel. I mean, I mean, excuse me, boycotting uh, the white hotels in this city, right? Right? Well, I, I'm trying to figure out how I can go along with it since they've been boycotting me for three years anyway. I managed to survive with black boycott all along. <laughs> and if you own, see, we don't have any problem at Yahweh Resort Hotels. We have five in the city, one on the, one on the beach, and we're full. And we're full every season. We don't have any room. That's right. People from all over the world stay with us. And guess what? We don't have any management problem. We don't have any front desk problem. They're talking about they need jobs in management. They need jobs in higher management. They want to dictate to white people what to do with their hotels on the beach. That's crazy as hell. That's the dumbest thing that you can have on earth. When you buy your own hotel and you run it, you are the management. You are the front desk, you are the accountant. You don't have to sit around doing no crazy stuff like that. That's insane. Absolutely insane. And see, I can't have no enemies from black folk because the ones that's doing it out here anyway, they boycotted this too. 
that's right. And until you get it together and join hands together, instead of going through all this foolishness of begging other people to take care of you, you are never going to be respected in this country. How can anyone respect a beggar? You don't respect a beggar. You don't like the homeless yourself, or you put them up in your home. If you like the homeless, they wouldn't be any on the street. You don't like them, that's why you have them sleeping on the street. Oh, that's real. It's time for you to stop being a hypocrite and stop pretending, black men of America. You're talking about you're going to boycott white people in Miami. Where in the hell are you going? You're going to a white man in, in Fort Lauderdale. You're going to a white man in Georgia. Wherever in the hell you go in America, you're going to another white man. They're all the same family. What is wrong with you? Take your money out the bank then. Same people on the beach, on the bank in town. Stop shopping at Winn-Dixie and Publix then. The same people that you're trying to boycott on the beach that own the hotel, they own the bank, they own Publix, they own Winn-Dixie, they own your house, they own your neighborhood. You are stupid. <laughs> Praise Yahweh. It's time for you to wake up and get up and do something for yourself. Then the whole world will respect you. It's a shame to watch people come here 30 years ago, Cubans. I'm so proud of them, I don't know what to do. They got off the boat with nothing. Absolutely nothing. Castro took all their money. People came over here with nothing. Did they ask you permission to take over Miami? Did they come up, huh? They didn't ask you permission? They just took it, huh? They took jobs you didn't want? The low paying job. You know, the low paying job, jobs you didn't want no more. They took those jobs. Slept 50 to a house, changed shifts, the next crew came in and slept. They only had one gas bill, one light bill, one, one note. Next thing you know, they bought the house. They all buying gas, going, to, they get a van and 25 of them get in the van and go to work. One car note, one gas bill, pooling the money, saving the money. Start going to the store, buy the store. Then they shop at their own store. Next thing you know, they own Malone and Hyde. Then you want to get mad at Cubans. Doggone Cuban, Cuban, take our job. You've been here longer than the alligator been here. You came here before the alligator had nerve to come up in here. He's been here 435 years, haven't done nothing with all the money you have. Cubans come here in 30 years, take the lowest paying jobs in town, own all the downtown, now you want to get mad at them. I'm here to tell you, so-called black man, you all better learn a new language. You either come and join hands with me, or learn a new language. You might better learn Japanese or something. They buying up the country. Those are cousins, you know, those are cousins. Japanese are cousins, they buying the country up. My cousin, he's awesome. Cousin is awesome. I mean, they just buying it up right and left. So you better, you better start learning maybe Japanese. Oh, oh, oh Japanese. How many of you can speak Japanese? I can speak a little Japanese. Want to hear me say something? How many want to hear me speak a little Japanese right quick? Okay. All right. Toyota, Nissan, Sony, Mitsubishi.
See, you know more Japanese than you thought you did. They're easing it in on you. Kawasaki, they're easing it right in on you. If you don't learn Japanese, you better start learning Spanish then. Start saying, boom, this this. I'm trying to tell you. Because they keep moving in, consolidating. And you keep moving north, whether you like it or not. So they, they speak exclusive Spanish in little Havana, Hialeah, and a lot of other places. And if you don't speak Spanish, they won't hire you. Well, learn the Spanish then. <laughs> but if you own your own, you wouldn't have to go through that. Why don't you own Miami? You've been here 435 years. Why don't you own it? Cuban just came 30 years ago, they own it. Japanese were bombed out of existence 40 years ago. They came back from the atomic bomb. Become a world power. Even have to lend America money. What have you come back from? In the ghetto and love it. <laughs> a few of you that make a lot of money, you, you, you want out. Move as soon as you can. Pay big money too. Long money to live out there. <laughs> it's all real. Why don't you send your children to Russia to learn? Why don't you send your children to Japan, to school? They're number one. America's number 19 in science. George Bush came on television last week and said he wants America to try to come up back to be number one in the year 2000. See, if the president of the country is talking about America, children coming back up by the year 2000, don't you understand that means you behind? And that there are a lot of other countries now in front of you in science, in math, in whatever it takes to be a power in the world. Your education is gone. So why don't you see your children in Japan? They're number one. Is it because you don't want a foreigner teaching your children? How many, you don't want a foreigner teaching your child? Let me see the hands of you. That you don't want your child going to Japan because you don't want a foreigner teaching them. Let me see it. You don't want, scared to raise your hand, huh? You know I have one for you, don't you? If you holler, you don't want the Japanese to cheat, don't you love everybody? Say you do, you say you love everybody. Well, why don't you love the Japanese? Why don't you love the Chinese? Since you love everybody. Why don't you love the Cubans in town? Why you don't love them? You love everybody. You don't want foreigners teaching your kids, right? Well, who do you think been teaching them? You haven't. And when you teach in the public school system today, that's not your curriculum. You didn't write it. You didn't write the textbook. You can't write your children into power. You don't have the keys. You don't have the knowledge of how to write your children into rulership. You can't teach it at home, and you can't teach it in school. You lost something with integration, talking about the school situation, didn't you? Can you imagine a white teacher standing up saying to her integrated class, all of you little black kids out there in this classroom, you're gonna have to be 10 times better than me and all of these other white kids out here. What would happen to her? What would, fire! So no one's going to tell your kid that. So you're letting your children get a big dose of white supremacy and no balance. No balance. And you wonder why you're in poverty. I hope the picture is getting a little clear to you. We must teach our own children like other nations teach their own children. And until you are willing to pay the price, make the sacrifice to teach your own children, then you're doomed.
your children are doomed to hell, your children are doomed to inferiority, and they're never going to be worth two cents in world competition. It's impossible. Because here is your child sitting up in the classroom learning about Little Red Riding Hood, Hansel and Gretel. Hmm? The three bears. And what's worst of all, Cinderella. You all know the story of Cinderella? That's a little blonde haired, blue eyed girl living in the ghetto. <laughs> Cinderella is about a little blonde haired, blue eyed girl living in the ghetto. Cinderella teaches the little white girl how to get out of the ghetto. What does she have to do? She's living there, got a mean old mama, grandmama, somebody, stepmama, a house full of rats, roaches, right? Pumpkins. She wants to be rich. So she had a fairy godmother, came into her life, worked some magic for her, turned her rats into horses, her pumpkin into a carriage, turned her shoes into fine glass slippers, turned her rags into fine garments, told her, now you go to the palace, meet Prince Charming. All you have to do, baby, is fake it till you make it. <laughs> Look good, honey. Trick the prince. That's what the fairy godmother taught her. Now I have news for you. Here you are sitting in this classroom, learning all about Cinderella, and I have news for you. Your rats will never turn to a horse. Your pumpkin will never turn to a carrot. And if you get some clothes, first of all, you don't have a fairy godmother to turn something for you. Hmm? And if you get to the palace, you surely won't get Prince Charming. You might get pregnant, but you won't get Prince Charming. But see, the white girl can be however poor she wants. She can dress up, do all these fine things, and go get Prince Charming. And the fairy godmother taught her how to do it. Now, you know the secret of the fairy godmother, right? Fairy. You know? She teach him how to get her, you know? Teach her how to get him. Teach the guy to get the man, right? Now, you know your, your fairies can't do that. They may have AIDS, but they can't do that. They can't raise you good enough. So what are you going to do with fairy godmothers, and what are you going to do with, with Cinderella? Nothing. You come out frustrated. Is that right? It's a fantasy world. All you do, you are groomed through all those fantasy stories for supporting a rat. They call it Disney World, but, you know, it's the big rat. You give all your money to go to the fantasy world, because that's all you studied all your life. You own no stock in Disney World. The chief executive officer of Disney World only makes $40 million a year. That's his salary before he gets his friends' benefits. You would have never dreamed of opening any kind of world, dizzy or otherwise. <laughs> this is real what I'm teaching you. Can anybody recognize I'm talking about keys tonight? I mean, can you see it? I'm giving up a lot of keys. I'm not going to give them all to you tonight, but I'm giving up some keys. Yahweh University is a perfect learning environment. Our children are respectful to their teachers, to their parents, to all adults everywhere. You can't go find students nowhere in this city or across America that's going to sit like that, all quiet, dignified, refined, and happy. Praise God. They would be all over the auditorium throwing popcorn, making noise. You know, some of them are your kids. You know how it is. I can't do nothing with that child, honey. 
<laughs> but we don't have that problem. We don't have any syphilis in our school, no gonorrhea, no AIDS, no social diseases. None of our children use profanity. They don't curse nobody out. You can't stand y'all university and do that. That's not true in the public school. Isn't it a miracle what's taking place? It's a perfect learning environment. Our children can count to vegetarian. They can name all the chemical elements, spell them, define them, tell you what it means to put one chemical with another chemical and what that produces, what product you get from that reaction. That's because we teach them. And then I take it a step further. I have institutionalized the knowledge of Yahweh at Yahweh University so that every single graduate from Yahweh University will never, ever have to go knock on somebody else's door for a job. If we don't have the business ready to hire them, I'll build it, I'll create it. I guarantee every graduate a job. I take that as my personal responsibility. All who follow me, we take that as our responsibility. And I say to you, my people, it is your responsibility to educate your own children and provide jobs for your own children, just as other nations are providing jobs for their own children. You must rise up and take your place so you can have the respect and the honor and the dignity that is due you that can only come when you rise up and build your own businesses for yourself as others. So Yahweh University is producing now rulers and future rulers. I have those here in, in Yahweh University who are now in college getting their degree in accounting. I have one right here. Did you stand, baby? There's one. She will be graduating soon from Miami Dade. Yes. In accounting, she already has a job. First rate food. She's one of our accountants. Bless you. Uh, I have uh, one of our students up here who's studying uh, right now at Yahweh University gynecology and to be an obstetrician. Right here in our school, master all there is. I have one of my students who has uh, just passed his state exam uh, for our general contractor, and he made straight A's in all three sections. Straight, he aced it. His lowest figure was, his lowest grade was 97. And I have those who are in Yahweh University now have 12, I have 12 or 14, 14 students between the ages of seven and 10 who are studying dentistry. They know everything about your mouth. They name everything, there's nothing, there's no knowledge about your mouth that they don't know. They're just too little to pull the teeth. You have to admit that's a miracle in your midst. What are your children learning in the public school? What are they learning? Our children use vocabulary that you just can't deal with. You need a, a, a dictionary, thesaurus, and everything else just to try to deal with them. Send them him, find it. You need all of it to deal with my children. They will scare a doctor degree, scare you up from teaching, from walking in the classroom. They are too incredible. That's a fact. Now let's talk about politics for a moment. I'm moving rather quickly. Still giving you keys on how to move from population. I'm talking to three kind of people in here. One is the conscious mindset, the unconscious, and the dead. And I know that when I come to you, I'm speaking to those three kind of people. Now dead is a very interesting kind of person. Dead mindset, they're a group of people who it, like when you see a dead body in the mortuary, and you see it in one room, and tomorrow you come back to the mortuary and see it in another room, what do you know happened? Somebody moved it. You see a dead man laying on a cooling board in the mortuary. He lays back on the cooling board and he never tells you, I'm tired of laying here. He never says, well, will somebody please turn me over? If it's hot in the room, the dead man it doesn't sweat. He won't, you set a fire to him, he won't get a blister. He get cold, no chill bumps. 
You turn the light on the dead man, his eyes won't blink. Just lay there. Then there's the unconscious man. They'll hear my message tonight, too. See, the dead mind is hearing my, my, my message tonight. Then the unconscious mindset is also hearing my message tonight. He is, he's a little different from the dead man. He's very interesting, too. The unconscious mindset that hears my message, he is one who says, when you, you touch him, he'll flinch. He get cold, he get chill bumps. In other words, he responds to stimuli. Right? Then you have the conscious mind. He's the mind that, that's totally different from the other two. The dead man, when this meeting is finished, someone will say, well, he didn't hear it, he didn't see it, he doesn't know nothing about what I did, like what in the world went on there? That's a mentally dead man. The unconscious mindset in this, in this meeting, at the end of the meeting, he might come in my presence and say, Yahweh been Yahweh, I heard you, I heard that. That's very interesting, very good. I'm with you. I'm with you. Way back behind you. I'm behind you. Way back behind you. <laughs> That's a fact. Then the conscious man, he hears what I'm saying, understands what I'm saying. It's very clear to him what I'm saying. And he's the one that's willing to make a difference, ready to make a difference in his life and the lives of our people in general, and is ready to join hands, get up, and get something done. And I'm conscious that I'm dealing with those three types of mindsets. Just want you to know that. So I won't be disappointed about which one you are. Politics. Listen well. Most powerful keys you want to hear on earth and move from poverty to riches. I'm going to call your attention to you. You and your family should be both Democrat and Republican. You're Democrat and Republican. Your husband should be Democrat, the wife should be Republican. Or husband should be Republican and the wife Democrat. It's 60 million so-called black people in America. What if 30 million of us voted Democratic? 30 million of us were in the Republican Party. What would happen? We'd always win. My Jewish family, they're very smart. There's only 5 million of them in America. They always win. Because the Jews support 52% of all the income of the Democratic Party and something like 60 to 64% of the Republican Party. How can they lose? Why do you lose? You always Democrats. After the Civil War, you were Republicans and you ruled everything. So they kicked you out because you didn't have it together. Today you're always a, a, a Democrat so that when it's time to get elected, all the white Democrats vote Republican. Why? Because you vote Democrat. And they don't want you to have any of the power. I have 200 registrars, voter registration registrars. Half of them are Republican. Half of them are Democrat. Half of my followers are Democrat. Half of my followers are Republican. We win. See, I don't believe in either party. I just believe in winning. It's time to win. So don't, don't get me hung up on that part. I'm, now, the next thing is, I want you to hear, listen real well. Remember the government's listening to me, and remember the FBI's in here listening tonight. But I want to tell you one of the big secrets. I'll say it a little soft, make them listen real hard. How many of you would like to rule America without, without having to pick up a gun and do no violence, just real peaceful? You'd like to rule America? You would. How many of you would like to rule the world? You would. How many of you would like me to tell you the secret of how you can rule America without any problem? Okay. Now sit on the edge of the seat. On the edge. Here, here you go. If 60 million black people in America, all you need to do is have 10 babies each. <laughs> That's it.
600 million babies. It's only 200 million people in America. Oh, I got to get out of here. Time is running out. Isn't that terrible? I have to really get out of here tonight. It's, time is flying. It's hard for me to see what time it is, but it's still flying. Is it all right if I take another 10 minutes? You want me to continue for a minute? See, when you, te when you teach 600 million babies to vote, baby, vote, huh? You got it. Yeah. Yeah. See, it's so easy. It's fun having babies. You're the only one on the earth that have quit having babies. Yeah, all the birth control clinics are in your neighborhood. The health clinics are in your black school. And you're the only one helping kill two million of your black babies every year, call it abortion. White people are out in the street teaching their women to stop doing abortion and have the babies. So when I see a little black baby, I, I stop and tell the mother, well, may I touch your child? This is the luckiest little nigga on earth right here. <laughs> <laughs> Kids, you just made it through birth control, you made it through the rubber and the condom and, 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 and foam and, 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 and tubal ligations, hysterectomies. I mean, kids, you are lucky. I have to touch a kid like that. You go out into the suburbs and white women got two in the stroller, one on the hip, one walking and pregnant. So, you can just take over the country real easy, no problem. 60 million of you have 10 babies each, and then you tell them to vote. Then another thing you do, you say, all right, now, I want you to move in this neighborhood right over here. And when your kid moves in that neighborhood, you tell all your kids, you, know, you just move in this neighborhood. You go pick your neighborhood and put your kid in it. What happens to the neighborhood? Everybody else does what? They move. With six, 600 million kids moving into all the neighborhoods, all these other people be swimming, going across the ocean, trying to get back somewhere else. Where? <laughs> I know you appreciate it here. You understand my message. If it wasn't for, for God having your babies have some babies, there wouldn't be none of you left in 20 years. Because the rest of you have started having 1.2 children. That point, I don't know what that is, but you know, you'd be having it. Isn't that an easy way? How many of you understand that America is for sale? Yeah, America is for sale. Always been for sale. You just didn't know. You just didn't have any money in your mind. But you have plenty of money. You have riches if you put it together. Start loving each other, start trusting one another, and you'll have all the money that you need. But you bought the world's biggest trick, individualism in love with materialism. So you want all the debt you can get now and all the pain that goes with trying to pay it back instead of pooling your money and your resources to create your own industries. Well, I'm here to show you how to do it, help you to do it. I'm here to buy up all of Miami, buy all of Dade County. I'm here to buy the country if necessary. That's what I'm here to do. I'm here to just buy it. Praise God. Now, some of you didn't clap. See, it's like, you jealous of me because I'm gonna buy it? You already, been, you already got all that money, and you're going to buy everything. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll tell you what. Let's you and me buy it together. <laughs> so like, if you don't clap now, that means what? You don't want to save anything. Well, I'm erasing all of your excuses, all of your excuses tonight. And I know you're gonna pass the word, and I know what I'm saying is being recorded so that it can be passed on. Also, I wanna let you know that I'm the best thing that ever happened to America.
ever. Praise God. And for all of you that have passed out the lie that I'm down on white people, you're just a lie. I'm up on you. I'm not down on white people. I'm up on you. I have no interest in trying to put white people out. I'm just interested in putting you in. I'm the hell. I have no desire for white people to be poor. I'm only here to help you to be rich. And I can assure you that I am here to save all good people on the earth, regardless of their race, their creed, their color, or whatever uh, there is that's supposed to make a difference. Let me tell you something about me right quick on that score. When you understand that I believe in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and I believe in practicing what it teaches from Genesis to Revelation, the more you know about the Bible, then the more you'll know about me. And what that includes is this reality. All men on this earth today are the descendants of three men, this side of the flood. Noah and his three sons, and his son's three wives, and Noah's wife. Only eight people made it. Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. All the other people were drowned on the other side of the flood. So that means that all nations on this earth come from Ham, or Shem, or Jephthah. All of them being the sons of Noah. All of the Gentile nations on the earth come from Jephthah. Right now. And all the people who you call African are from the son Ham. I am a descendant of Shem, the Shemites. Those are the three people. And that's who you, the so-called black men of America, are. You are the Shemites. You are the Hebrew Israelites, the children of the Bible. Every promise in that Bible belongs to you. And it's a sin to go to church and don't know that. So what that means is that all of us are family. Now something horrible has taken place to have family members killing each other in the home, in the community, in the city, state, the country, and the world. And it's a very wicked mindset that has taken hold of people that came down through Lucifer and through those descendants we have wicked people sitting in high places ruling in this world. And every wicked man on the earth must be brought down and chased out of this world. And it's going to happen because it's written that it's going to happen. And wicked people are not just white people, and you know that. If you think it's just some white people that's wicked, you're insane. Not with all these black folk killing each other hurting one another. It's some black devils worse than anything you've ever seen. If all white people left the earth this second, all hell would break out of America. I'd be the first one catching the flight out. I wouldn't stay here with a bunch of niggas, I'll tell you the fact. Can you imagine all the niggas of America with guns? You, you talk about death and destruction. Ethics, they don't care nothing about God anymore. They don't care about religion. No, nothing. Most dangerous people, the only thing keeping niggas in check is white folks. Y'all just hold on a little, white people, please hold on to the niggas just a little while longer until I can get them in check. <laughs> then let me have them. I'll fix it up for you. <laughs> Don't give up yet. I know it's hard. The white man's burden is a terrible thing to have to carry. I'm glad I'm not white. I wouldn't want to carry you niggas for nothing in the world. 
The only thing that can help you is you change your mindset. How many admit black folk have a terrible mindset? It's horrible, it's pitiful, it's sad. It's the most divisive and destructive thing. Black folk just tear up everything. They tear down a brick house. You can't hardly keep niggas in jail. I mean, they are destructive. They tear things down without a reason and don't build nothing back in its place. They destroy everything they get their hands on. The house, the neighborhood, the husband, the wife, they tear each other up. You know I'm right, it's hard, but I have to tell the truth. So white people, just hold on a little while. I'll ease your burden. I'm working day and night, and some of us are really serious about this. And y'all hold on. It's, I know it's rough. 400, be, boy, for God to choose you to beat up on us for 435 years is a terrible job. Because he didn't let you kill us. He said you can't kill us. You can kill some of us, but you can't kill all of us because we are Job. And he put that on you, and you know it, and I know it, and I want you to know I know it. So I'm teaching all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Yahweh, and of the Son, Yahweh, and Yahweh, and of his holy word, Yahweh, the holy word of Yahweh, which was God from the beginning. I bless all good people in the name of Yahweh, the creator. I'm born as a gift to all good people of the planet Earth, regardless of your race, your nationality, creed, or religion. I've established the government of Yahweh, and I have established the nation of Yahweh. My words are designed sift the nations and cause the glorious voice of Yahweh to be heard among all the people of the earth. And I'm doing a good job of that. You can look at world events and see that the time of wicked rule is fulfilled. And the kingdom of Yahweh is near. So repent and compensate for breaking the laws of Yahweh and believe the good news that I bring. America, in addition to the poverty of my people, you have over 15 million unemployed and homeless people living in poverty in this great land of opportunity, as taxes are killing you as businessmen. Yahweh has raised me up to move the world from poverty to riches, the whole world. I'm proving I have the keys to do that by moving the so-called black man. Those of you who are called black people, who join hands with me, I'm making you rich. I do not take a salary. I have never taken a salary. I do not carry money. And what you see me on with, I don't wear it. I, it belongs to my followers. They keep it. Oh yeah, they keep it. They just want me to look like this. I don't mind. It's still theirs. I don't take a salary, but I've established $100 million in this country for my followers. It's all in their name. They own all the corporations. If my body were to disappear tonight, I leave my followers rich with the knowledge of how to keep it forever and add to it. Good evening, everyone. And to the Honorable Yahweh Ben Yahweh, well, let me say this one thing that uh, I hope the media is here, the Miami Herald, whoever, and I hope you write about this educational institution that this organization has, and you tell the Commission of Education of Florida, write to her, tell her, the, the Commission of Education of Florida to tell her superintendents across the state that all kids can learn if they're taught. Write about it talk about it. And to the Honorable Yahweh Ben Yahweh, my son who's taken my job away from me is going to read this plaque to you. Presented to Yahweh Ben Yahweh in appreciation for his leadership. State Representative Jefferson Reeves, Sr., Miami, Florida, October 7, 1990. To his eminence. Bless you. Bless you. I love 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 you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I love you. I want you all to know I love you. I love Miami. I'm determined to help make this the greatest city on earth. After all, you remember these words. Egypt 
has her pyramid. India has the Taj Mahal. Orlando has the big rat, Disney World. But you have the Son of God, the world's greatest attraction. Let's take advantage of it. It's time to make a change, and we are the people who can do it. Yo, what's up? It's time. I'm gonna keep it with mine, y'all know. It's time. Here we go. It's time. It's time. It's time.